Council. I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal sure. if I could. Uh, this is a uh, long-term marriage of 23 years that produced two daughters, one of which is at uh, law school at University of Florida. The second is 15 at present. The first issue is that in terms of the issue of permanent alimony, the trial court overlooked the um, issue of the presumption of permanent alimony in a long-term marriage case. There's numerous facts that council has suggested in terms of um, there's red herrings, in essence, because they're not established facts, and we'll get to those, but the, the court needs to address that. That's probably the most important issue in this particular case. Um, in terms of the wife, it was way of background, the wife had not worked full time in 20 years at the time of the final hearing. She was a licensed CPA, but had not actively practiced as a CPA since 1991, and the most she had ever earned was less than what the trial court imputed to her. However, the, tr the trial court had substantial evidence in terms of the amount imputed, but the first um, point that I'd like to address is that the trial court failed under this court's Schlegel opinion. The trial court immediately imputed income to her regardless of the fact that the trial court indicated that it would take, quote unquote, six to 12 months for her to obtain employment at that particular rate. So the trial court noted that the wife had made no effort to uh, work in the last 16 months that the trial court, that the case had been pending. However, the wife had not worked at all since 2006 and was under no obligation at all by any temporary order to work. So I would submit to the court that your Schlegel opinion, which counsel cites in his brief as uh, law but not for that proposition, would warrant reversal on that particular issue. The second, the trial court used dated uh, income information for the former husbands um, for, the, uh, uh, for child support purposes, both in the original determination and in the modification. We'll get to the issue of the modification in a minute, but there was two times the court used dated information for the former husband's income. We presented at trial evidence that uh, 2010 was not the correct time frame to utilize. There was a pay stub for the middle of the year which showed that the former husband was on pace just in terms of his income, eliminating the bonus for a second, to earn approximately $10,000 higher. So we would submit that the court uh, used inappropriately an average. The Woodard case that we've cited in our brief indicates that averages have no, um, that they're meaningless in essence. And there's, um, the case law is replete with, uh, with cases that stand for the proposition and we've just cited one that the trial court is to use current income. Um, in terms of permanent alimony, again, the, we would submit that the trial court failed because um, prior to uh, separation, um, the, the, the trial court failed in, in, in terms of statutorily, the trial court was required to determine the marital lifestyle. The court didn't determine that. It did uh, indicate that 19000 a month was what the parties had in terms of net income and that they spent that. And we presented expert testimony. Robert Cheatham testified as our CPA, and he uh, testified, testified without rebuttal that the lifestyle was $13,000, 13925 to be specific. The final judgment simply says that the lifestyle was quote unquote quite high. However, the trial court doesn't grapple with what the lifestyle was and simply determined that the, that the former wife's needs, utilizing the needs and necessity language that trial courts use in lower uh, length of marriage cases, not in long-term marriage cases, um, was seven to $8,000. The trial court wasn't specific and used a figure that was far less than what the actual need was in terms of the former wife. Um, so in essence, the former wife received in the final analysis, temporarily 7,500 in, in terms of the bifurcation, but in the final analysis, 5,000 a month, the trial court determined she could immediately have 3,500 uh, in earned income per month. The trial court uh, imputed interest on her IRA of $1,137.67 and determined that she had interest income of 127783 In total, that's uh, $10,915.30 which is less than the unrebutted uh, lifestyle of $13,925. Um, also, the trial court erred because it ignored established case law that it needed to determine why durational alimony was appropriate it, it, uh, in opposition to permanent uh, alimony. The trial court clearly, given the age of the former husband, was trying to time alimony to stop at the age of 64, close in time to a normal retirement age. However, in a permanent alimony situation, and we've cited supplemental authority to the court, this issue just came up in the Modi case, uh, we would submit that permanent alimony was appropriate and at the very minimum, the trial court should remand to have the trial court determine why 
uh, permanent alimony was inappropriate. Uh, this, another factual error and legal error was that the trial court in the final proceedings determined that uh, time sharing, giving the former husband substantial time sharing was appropriate even though the former husband at most had exercised three to five overnights and the trial court um, utilized child support um, based on the time sharing that it was uh, implicitly determining would occur. In fact, we went back on a modification because we filed a modify because the former husband still wasn't utilizing any time sharing. The evidence at trial was he had an extra bedroom but was had it stacked with things that had no bearing to having time sharing with the daughter and that he had only taken her to um, the party's beach house several times for overnights, less than you know, three to five overnights. The, the statute is specific. If through no fault of the former wife, the former husband fails to exercise time sharing, the court should modify child support. And we would submit that based on this, 6130, uh, 11, A, 10, and C, that the uh, allegation of alienation was wholly not proven. There's no evidence of any alienation by the former wife. In fact, she testified without rebuttal. She was encouraging the child to, to visit with the father. And the former husband simply testified that the child uh, didn't want to and he was leaving it up to her. Um, that isn't sufficient under the statute and we would submit error in that regard. Um, in terms of the former husband's book of business, he functions as a stockbroker and he has a book of business. His um, boss, the president of Allen & Company, testified, and he testified if, and we recognize this as a contingency, if the former husband left Allen & Company, he would receive one year's uh, gross revenues in terms of compensation by a new brokerage firm if he placed that book of business elsewhere. Um, that book of business under the Alpha case uh, from uh, Florida jurisprudence is a marital asset to be valued. We recognize it's contingent, that value would only be operative if the former husband left and that book of business followed him. But we would submit that the trial court should have reserved jurisdiction and should have valued that book of business and reserved jurisdiction to apply that valuation or at least reserve jurisdiction to value it if he left sometime in the future um, based on that uh, clear marital asset. Marital assets are broadly defined under Florida law. 61.075 6A1, marital assets are all assets acquired during the marriage. Um, clearly, um, Florida courts have dealt with contingent options, have dealt with uh, unvested retirement plans. All of those things are contingent assets, and the trial court had uh, more than ample evidence. It has had the former husband's own boss that testified that this was a, um, a, a marital asset and would be realized if he left, the only contingency being if he left. The next uh, factual error by the trial court was the debt to the former wife's mother. They bought a home together and obtained a loan for $136,000. Under the uh, Jahnke case, J-A-H-N-K-E, it was the former husband's uh, obligation to prove that that debt didn't exist. In fact, the former husband proved that it did exist by all three of his financial affidavits listing it as a debt. Um, the, the contrary to the, to the trial court's statement, the former wife's mother came and testified testified there was a note for that obligation and that she considered it a debt. The former wife, after the final hearing, paid off that debt. Um, there clearly was a um, debt here and, and the former husband's trial testimony on this issue at trial was, quote unquote, I agree that I owe her uh, the $136,000, Isabel and I. Um, that's on page 92 of the transcript. So we would uh, submit that not only did he not carry his burden, in fact, the former wife, uh, responded and demonstrated that it was in fact debt. At trial, there was a colloquy between uh, counsel and my client. And that, that colloquy was about the 2010 joint tax return. And counsel asked the former wife, do you plan on signing the 2010 joint tax return? Uh, the former wife answered, yes, once I review it. After trial, and at the, at the time the form, the, the uh, the tax return was presented to the former wife. There was no pleading prior to trial that referenced this tax return. There was no motion for rehearing. There was no reservation of jurisdiction. There was no appeal relating to it. After the trial was concluded and, and that final judgment was raised judicata, the former wife was handed the tax return and said, please review it and sign it. And she reviewed it and there was 
ample emails back and forth to the CPA to, to demonstrate that she had reviewed it. And she ultimately said, I am happy to sign this return, but I want to receive a check for half of the savings. At the hearing on this issue, the former wife proved that the former husband said, okay, I'll pay that to you. I just have to get a loan from Allen and Company to pay that obligation. Um, next, there was an, uh, a motion that, or an email or letter of some, some form that said you were blackmailing our client and there was a 1.540 fraud or misrepresentation motion that followed alleging fraud on the former wife um, in terms of her statement at trial. There was a full one day trial on this and ultimately the trial court determined that this is a fact driven issue and I'm quoting from the court's order and there was the final judgment was raised judicata and there was no facts at all to support the claim of fraud or misrepresentation. However, even though the former wife prevailed and had filed a 57105 motion as it relates to this, sent the letter, uh, uh, observed the 21 day safe harbor, ultimately filed the motion and asked the court to consider it, the trial court declined saying that there was an issue, an undefined issue that relates to that. We would submit that that is error, that the trial court having determined that there was no facts to support the allegation and that the final judgment was raised to Dakota on this was required to award the former wife uh, the one day trial fees and costs for having had to deal with this issue that was uh, that the trial court had determined was frivolous. The last issue is the interest calculation on the um, inheritance. There's a Levin case or Levine case that both sides agree um, is law on this issue. And in that issue, the appellate court determined that the trial court erred when it imputed interest on sums that were not available for investment. Remember we talked earlier about the imputation of income. The trial court in, in setting alimony determined that the former wife had $1,277.83 of, of interest income. This derives from her inheritance. There's no question that she inherited a substantial sum. The former husband tagged that sum as being a million $238,956. The former wife disagreed about the value of the ultimate inheritance by $65,000. Said it was $65,000 less because there was a pension that was involved that neither the estate nor her were beneficiary of and it hadn't been decided who was entitled to those sums. But which, whichever number it is, the $1,238,000 or $65,000 less than that, each side agreed that the net sum, net of whatever was uh, legally entitled to be deducted had to have an interest rate attached to it. We all agreed with that calculation. We just agreed, disagreed with the ultimate amount. The trial court used the figure 511,131.78 and both sides, well, I think ultimately the trial court agreed with us, 3% interest applied. So it was 15,334 divided by 12 and that's where the number the trial court used on a monthly basis was derived from. However, there are several errors in terms of calculation in that by the trial court in terms of getting at the net sum because our net sum is much different. Our net sum would be $254,055. The first error was the $65,000 pension amount. The expert, Mr. Strauss, for the former husband, testified he didn't know who was the beneficiary. And the former wife said, I'm not the beneficiary as yet. The trial court was required to reserve jurisdiction on that. The biggest issue is the beach house. The parties without uh, dispute had a beach house that was part of their marital standard of living. They had a half interest in a beach house with a friend of the former wife's. That beach house was awarded to the former husband. The former wife, post final judgment, post inheritance, simply replicated that standard of living when she bought another beach house. The former husband says for cash, she in part borrowed money from her mother, in part paid cash, but the total beach house amount was 371,774. We would submit that that is error to have utilized those sums for purposes of interest calculation under Levin. She was simply replicating the standard of living as she was entitled to do. The next factual issue in terms of error was the $136,000 that they borrowed from their mother. Uh, even if the court was correct that that was not a marital debt, the court said that that was non-marital. She simply paid that off so there shouldn't be any interest that attaches to that. The former wife spent $114,000 both for renovations to the beach house after purchasing it and for renovations to the home. Those sums were not available for, for interest uh, as well. And then she accounted for the balance being 
uh, 40,000 in pending expenses, 61,928 in post-judgment attorney's fees, 2567 to her CPA, uh, a $3,000 early withdrawal penalty, about $5,000 for household expenses. But we would submit that the, this court should remand to the trial court to determine what the correct calculation is under the Levin statute and give the trial court some definition of how to do it. It's a, it is a fairly complicated issue to brief, as you, the court may have recognized, but, but I think I've given you exactly what the parameters are involved. I think the court can make the correct calculation, but at the very minimum, you should remand uh, for, the issue, for those issues. There were also costs to sell the house and the lot that the former wife inherited that weren't taken into account. There was a factual dispute about one lot. One lot was worth. It's a fairly nominal dispute, but let's assume the trial court agreed with the former husband's position in that regard. That's a, about a $1,500 difference, but those are the differences um, between the two. So I, I don't like to raise seven issues to the appellate court. Um, but I think they're all substantial. So I appreciate your attention. Thank okay. you. Thank you, for, uh, this long. you have about uh, four minutes left. Thank you. Hey, please, the court. My name is John Frost. I have the privilege of representing John Campbell, the husband in this case. Um, this is an abuse of discretion case. And this trial judge, if you look at the order that he drafted, or the many orders he drafted in this case. We were dealing here with a um, wife who has a uh, CPA degree from Tulane University, has a master's from the University of Miami, who is bilingual, who has um, the ability to work. And one of the things that the judge did is he considered all this when he came up with all of his numbers. And there was evidence in the record that uh, from Don Savage that she was capable of making between forty two and fifty thousand dollars and they argue about whether the trial judge well he didn't he didn't consider the six months to a year that it would take her to um, reach the amount well the judge clearly says in his order he did take that into consideration uh, and what he did he said it, it could be before it could be between 42000 and 50000 and he said gross income, and he says when he arrived at the forty-two, he said, and I quote from his order, this does acknowledge it will take the wife six to 12 months to find a job based on the findings above. So what he's saying is, is maybe it should have been higher, but I'm going to reduce it to 42 and I did take that into consideration because that was raised. He goes on to state that the court, the court would further find that the wife has made no effort in the last 16 months to obtain any job. And matter of fact, she, he also finds in here uh, on paragraph five, the wife does not want to work. And she said, I'm not going to work. Um, so as we talk about the amount of money he imputed to an individual who has the capability, she was 46 years old at the time of this divorce. Um, she had the capability. She also has a real estate license. She'd been active as a real estate agent uh, in 2006. Let me go back and try and discuss quickly each one of the seven issues that were raised, and we're looking at abuse of discretion. We first talk about the book of business. It was speculative. It would have to be that if the husband leaves Allen & Company, where he'd been for his major part of his whole life, his work life, he'd been there, he testified, I have no intention of leaving. It would have to be if he leaves, if he goes out, out on his own, the book of business has no value. So if he does that, it has no value. If he goes with a company that has a plan where they would pay for this, there's another if, there may possibly be some uh, value to that. If his clients go with him, because the book of business is based on how many clients he takes with him, that's if they don't leave Allen and Company, which is a reputable company here in Lakeland, if he doesn't go on his own and if they go with him. There's so many ifs here as to whether it has no value. He didn't own Allen and Company. He didn't have a majority interest in Allen and Company. He had some stock in Allen and Company, which was, was uh, set out in the equitable distribution. So again, it was totally highly speculative, and the judge said so. He said, I find this to be speculative. I'm not going to include it as an equitable distribution. 
So there was no abuse of discretion in that case. The gift from the former wife, the mother, what the court specifically found, he heard the testimony, he said, did he abuse his discretion? He specifically found that Mr. Sessoms mentioned there was a promissory note. There was no promissory note entered into evidence. She couldn't find it. She said there may have been one, but I don't know where it is. So no, there was no written documentation. There was no payment on this alleged amount. No payment had been made. They'd been married 23 years. There was no interest. She couldn't testify there was any interest to be owed. There was no demand ever made on this amount of money until after the divorce was filed. And at the same time, she gave the $136,000 gift. She gave $136,000 to the other daughter. So again, the judge, based on all that, said this is a gift. And therefore, he didn't include it. The, I discussed the abuse of discretion, no abuse of discretion as to allocating certain funds to the wife or allocating an interest to the wife. The 57105, one sentence which Mr. Sessoms failed to read out of the court's order denying that is the fact that the court says, finally, the court finds that there is no basis for 57105 fees in this matter as there was a legitimate argument made, which the court felt was simply not proven. So again, under 57105, you have to find there's no justiciable issue at all. And this court so found that there was and denied the 57105 fees. Again, did he abuse his discretion? We would submit to you he did not. The trial court, as it relates to child support obligation, the court went all through that. And the court went through it as to saying when he bifurcated it, he told both of us up front, I'm not going back when I come back after the wife inherits his money. We're going to retry all these issues again as to child support except the amounts. Child support and alimony, we're going to try whether it should be permanent or whether it should be something else. And child support, we're going to recalculate that based on what I find. And he told us all that going in. That's what we did. And so when we went in again in the petition that they filed, the husband wants to visit, the former husband wants to visit with his child, that both of the parties supposedly agreed that they were going to let the child do this. And it has not taken off to the point to where the husband wishes it would be. But there are a lot of other factors about that. So the court calculated the child support again based on its findings. The trial court did not abuse its discretion by imputing interest. What the argument here is very simple. Mr. Sessom says, well, they had a beach house. They had a beach house. They had a half interest in a beach house that was underwater. That was awarded to the husband. It had a $204,000 value. It had a $197,000 first mortgage. It had a $37,000 second mortgage. So the entire beach house was underwater. He got it and got it underwater. The wife goes out and says, well, I got this money. We got a hearing coming up. And you'll notice the judge says it's two weeks before the hearing when we're going to recalculate the issue of alimony. And she's got this money. And she goes out and spends $300,000 on a new house, a beach house. It's not the house she lives in. She got the marital home. And she goes out and spends that money. And the court found, as rightfully so, that this was discretionary spending. And the two cases that were cited, Rosen and the Stifler case that he cites in his opinion, says that in that instance he can use that money and calculate interest on that money. And he did that. Mr. Frost, before you depart further away from the alimony issue, I'd like to ask you a question. Looking at the supplemental order, particularly paragraph 8, the language the trial court said is it finds that the permanent alimony would not be the most fair and reasonable type of alimony under the circumstances. Under the legislature's authority, they have said that this is a long-term marriage and there is a rebuttable presumption that there is an entitlement to permanent alimony. I do not find anywhere in the order that the trial court discusses 
that the presumption was in fact rebutted, which leads to the conclusion, is this the most fair and inappropriate legal standard for analysis here, and should it be remanded back for the trial court to address the rebuttable presumption matter? Your Honor, I think it does, although he doesn't use the word, mm -hmm. he does and does the analysis, because he goes on in that order. First of all, we have to go back to. Well, uh, he's yeah. got both of them. He's refers, refers to the first one. He's got the second one. He said, I did all this stuff before. Right. But I, you know. He doesn't use the language. I agree with you. Yeah, that's but my what, concern. Okay, but what he says is, and let me get to that one, because it's in there. Uh, because he goes to the analysis in the two cases, and he also does the analysis where he says, um, one of the things, let's see. For example, in the analysis paragraph two, he says there's two issues. In the case of permanent alimony, that's on page, I guess, 1129 of the record. Um, the trial court to consider the present party's need for alimony and build for the party's ability to pay, which is also true. But the next factor is this is a long-term marriage. Therefore, there's a rebuttable presumption. And as I've gone through it, I, you're right, the words are not there, but that, that was my concern. But he goes what on you're arguing is that it's all, everything's there but the words rebuttable presumption. The rebuttable presumption, Judge, I agree. But he goes on to look at the analysis. He analyzes the Margareta case, and he also does the Marshall Beasley case, which deal about that. And one of the things, and if you look at the finding that he finds, is one of the things that he says about it, uh, uh, Finally, the Marshall Beasley Court states that disparity in income alone does not justify permanent periodic alimony and that an award of permanent alimony is improper where the evidence does not reflect permanent inability on the part of the wife to become self-supporting. And I think he's using that case, Judge, where he's gone back and referred to the language and the finding in this case in his orders that the wife has got as a CPA, she has uh, got a master, she's bilingual, et cetera, that he's analyzing that case and the other case. Isn't there some decision law that suggests even the fact that the now former wife can earn money, that in and of itself doesn't re rebut the presumption of uh, entitlement to um, permanent alimony? You know. Well, that's, I'm using this as one of them. He okay. also goes up, if you look before, in the Manhattan, or it's the Margareta case, uh, it's further. In, in the case of permanent alimony, the trial court must also find that no other form of alimony is fairly, and he's, this is what he's citing, and that he's doing, it, sa it says, form of alimony is fairly and reasonable under the circumstances of the parties. The court also considered the case of Marshall Beasley, which involved a 21-year marriage with significant assets. There were additional issues involving imputing income to former wife and a discussion that the nature of alimony is a matter committed to the sound discretion of the trial court. The case goes on to discuss that the criteria used to establish the need and ability to pay includes the party's earning ability, age, health, education. Now, he's, he's already discussed in, in his both orders the earning ability. He's discussed the age. Both in, he, she's in good health. Her education, the duration of the marriage, standard of living enjoyed during the course, and the value of the party's estate. The Fourth District Court of Appeals cited numerous other cases which held that the party's standard of living was not a super factor over other consideration and that the party's standard of living during the marriage was not a useful guide in awarding alimony when the parties lived beyond their means, for in, as in this case. I mean, Judge, he did the analysis. Did he use the magic words, supposedly? No, he didn't. But I think if you read his opinion and read the other opinion, or uh, not opinions, his final judgment and his supplemental final judgment, he did the analysis and came up, and that's what he came up with. So I think he did discuss those, Judge. 
and did, did do the analysis that was necessary to reach the conclusion that he did. Um, again, I think that the um, issue on the 3% is not a dispute about the 3%. It's a dispute about the amount of money the wife had to apply the 3% to. And the judge looked at everything and said, well, she had this amount of money. She did voluntarily and made certain payments from that money. She didn't have to do that. She could have had that money and imputed. And under the two cases we cited, I think he was completely accurate in that. I, I noticed that uh, Mr. Sessoms didn't discuss the attorney's fees issue. The attorney's fees issue was agreed to. Mr. Sessoms even said in the record, you'll see it, is that he, he agreed that in this case, because of the assets the wife had that, that, uh, and all the fact that all of her bills had been paid and all, that uh, attorney's fees and costs for either party was not appropriate in this case. So I think those are the seven uh, issues. And we think, again, that this judge uh, did an outstanding job of, of look, listening to the evidence, deciding the issues, uh, writing the issues in more detail than uh, you know, I think he needed to, but that he did cover it. And that we would ask the court to uh, affirm the trial judge. And we have moved for fees and costs on this based on uh, the, the amount of money the wife now has uh, compared to what the husband has. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Frost. Thank you. Brief response. In terms of durational alimony, um, you can't just simply hint at the edges of it. Um, 61.08 sub 7 says durational alimony may be awarded where permanent alimony is inappropriate. So there's no finding that permanent alimony is inappropriate. But then it goes on and says the purpose of durational alimony is to provide a party with economic assistance for a set period of time following a marriage of short or moderate duration, which doesn't apply here, or following a marriage of long duration if there's no ongoing need for support on a permanent basis. Even according to the trial court's finding, using the erroneous standard of living, we would submit that, there, that the, the trial court's determination shows that that analysis is flawed. Um, and the lifestyle uh, is flawed as well. There's no response at all to that in terms of, of oral argument. So the alimony award is flawed in terms of not being permanent and in terms of amount of, according to the unrebutted um, evidence we would submit. Um, in terms of the immediate imputation of alimony, um, there was no argument, what I heard at the podium was not raised in the briefs, that somehow that there's a gloss on uh, paragraph 7 on page 5 of the final judgment, the language that says this does acknowledge it will take the wife 6 to 12 months to find a job based on the findings above. I think that refers to the previous sentence where the imputation of alimony paragraph is. Because um, it says above, I don't think it means the preceding sentence would, would be what you would normally use to modify a prior sentence. But that argument wasn't previously raised, and I think it's a stretch in terms of what the um, uh, final judgment says. And again, the Schlegel decision, no response to that, says that it was erroneous to immediately impute alimony. So we would submit that the court's own authority, um, as cited by counsel, would be uh, appropriate to reversal in that regard. Um, we acknowledge that there are contingencies in terms of the book of business. If he leaves, if he takes the book of business, the court needed to reserve jurisdiction to deal with that. It is clearly a marital asset. It clearly has value based on uh, the former husband's boss, Mr. Albright, who testified it does have value. And he, he didn't equivocate. He said if he leaves and he, if he goes to a large wirehouse, he will have this sum of money. So he shouldn't be left with that $500,000 figure to, to be portable and to take and to realize that once these proceedings are over. We would submit that there needs to be a reservation of jurisdiction in that regard. The argument in terms of the note to the mother was that there was no presentation of the note. However, the testimony from Rosa Sanabria, uh, the former wife's mother, was that a note existed and that uh, that wasn't rebutted by the former husband at all. To the contrary, he said that that existed and he filed three financial affidavits acknowledging that. Um, in terms of the trial court's uh, Resolution of 57105. The court said it was a fact issue. The court said the final judgment was raised judicata. The court said there was no facts that supported the, the uh, 1.540B claim. Therefore, there's no basis for having determined that there was a legitimate reason to deny fees. 
there were a substantial amount of fees that were incurred in that, and we would ask the court to reverse because uh, while there is an abuse of discretion, there was no basis, no predicate for that legal determination. The beach house obviously is the biggest issue in terms of the interest earnings. Uh, there's no question that there was a beach house of some equity or lack of equity that existed. The former wife is entitled to the standard of living. Uh, she should receive the standard of living. It's not uh, simply because she has a CPA license and she went to Tulane, she's somehow self-sufficient. That flies in the face of established Florida law, both in terms of amount of alimony and in terms of having the right to go to Anna Maria and have a beach house of her own. Um, and all she did was replicate the lifestyle. There's no contention that what she did was unreasonable. Um, she had the money, she utilized it. The Levine case or Levin case says that if you live in a house or you utilize a house as a vacation home, that there shouldn't be interest attributed to it. Um, so if there's no questions from the court, I appreciate your attention and um, thank you for considering all these issues. Thank you, Mr. Sessoms. Thank you. Thank you both. The court will be in recess for 15 minutes.